So thank you very much for letting us into your home today. I wanted to ask you about your life very early on and about your journey over here. Can you tell me about that? What I really remember, the, the childish things, I mean, not the sort of historic event of 10,000 unaccompanied child refugees, the, you know, the largest ever migration of children, but it was me leaving home, um, losing my doll, uh, being intrigued by another little boy who kept being sick. Um, and it was so very much childish memories of trauma. I mean, people were crying uh, on the platform as they waved us goodbye, and um, the children, not me, I'm very disciplined, but there were lots of children screaming and having, uh, and crying. Um, because each train, and there were 10 of them in the kinder transport, uh, each train had about a thousand children aged five to 16, with just two adults. So although it was well organized and we had you know, numbers around our necks, unfortunately I can't remember what my number was, um, but it was still a lot of children, largely unsupervised. And I think our train stopped from time to time and that little boy that was always being sick got off to be sick in the field. But I have read that the train was some trains were sealed. And I sometimes think, well, maybe that was it. Otherwise, how would one keep so many children safe? Uh, on that journey. So it was pretty horrendous and a very important part of my life really. But also I realised that um, very early on that I wanted my life to be one that was worth saving. You know, if you say to a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, aren't you lucky to be saved? You know, uh, you soon get that message that I'm extremely lucky to have been saved. Did you feel that even at five? Yes, I mean, because unfortunately people did um, go on about it. But anyway, um, so it made me determined to, that my life would be one that was worth saving, very dutiful I am. Uh, so I try not to fritter it away. So still in my 80s, I still work effectively full time and I enjoy it. And I think actually I'm lucky to have something to get up for each morning. So when did you discover the world of computing and how did you feel when you discovered it? When did I discover it? I was taking my honours maths degree at evening classes and a fellow student there was working in a corporate who had got one of the earliest computers and he sort of said you'd find this interesting um, come along and have a look so I uh, took holiday and spent a week of might have been a fortnight in his laboratory um, basically making myself useful and learning the very rudiments of how you made this machine do whatever you wanted it to do and it was like falling in love again. It was really um, exciting, demanding. Um, you, you, you knew somehow that it was so important for the future. And most people were concentrating on the hardware, but I was entirely on the software. And, um, which at that time was, was sort of given away free with the hardware. So I was a bit out of step already because I was saying the software was important. But it was an early start and I would be in my early 20s. I would describe my work as a sort of junior mathematical clerk. I was working on one of those electric uh, comptometers, right, developing graphs, um, doing some statistical work, um, working on something called waveguides. Um, but the things that I remember most are on the transatlantic telephone cable, lots of, you know, because there were so many of them, um, lots of calculations there. Um, working on the very first electronic telephone exchange, which was at Highgate Woods in England, um, and working on the premium bond computer, Ernie, where I was one of a team of two responsible for checking the randomness of that lottery system. Everybody joked, you know, sort of make sure I win. <laughs> we even, you know, I'm very firm on ethics, you know, is it correct that I can work, can I buy 
premium bonds myself. I presume you weren't allowed to, were you? Yes, we were, were because we discussed it very seriously and there was no way in which we could alter it. Mm, mm. Then you decided to set up on your own. You set up your own business. Can you tell me more about that and why you left Dollars Hill? Well, I left Dollars Hill on marriage because I married a physicist whom I'd met there on the so-called wave guides. Um, And um, although it wasn't essential for me to leave, I felt it was better that we pursued our own career because most, there were very few women in research at that time anyway. So I moved to a little computer company um, and again basically hit that glass ceiling that it was an excellent company of about 30 strong. Um, I was doing very, you know, I was doing very innovative work, but I was also managing a small team for the first time. And I again felt blocked. And so pretty well overnight something happened. And and I mean, it has nothing to do with you. Um, And um, I decided to set up a company to develop software um, where there would be no glass ceiling because I was going to slant it the other way Mm. and predominantly employ women like me um, with young family planned or in existence. Uh, so the, the very first minute of the annals of the company um, talked about uh, the employment policy will be jobs for women with children. And then as I realized the sort of importance of training, that soon changed to careers for women with children. And then um, there were a lot of women looking after disabled partners or um, elder care and that eventually changed to um, careers for women with dependents. And then in 1975, equal opportunities legislation came in, which made it illegal to have our pro-female policies, and it was. I mean, I didn't go into business to make money. Yeah. Um, I went into business to have an interest, sure, um, but mainly to provide a route for, for women to lead our own lives. Mm-hmm. And um, that crusade for women really drove us for many years. Suddenly, we, the woman's company, had to let the men in. It was great fun. <laughs> and did you find, so you, you've talked about this glass ceiling, did you find it was almost essential for you to set up your own business in order to provide yourself and other women with work? I'm just trying to understand the landscape at the time of women working that had children. Well, I'd been with two organisations, one large, uh, one small, both of them excellent organisations where I had felt blocked. In my first job, there was a salary scale for men and a salary scale for women, very much lower. Um, And one was meeting this sort of overt discrimination. There were certain things that you could not do. I couldn't work um, on the stock exchange. Part of my work should have taken me onto a ship uh, and I wasn't allowed to do that. Women, we don't have women on ships. Um, you couldn't drive a bus, not that I wanted to, mm. fly an aeroplane, it is mm. something bad. Was, it, was this illegal or this was something was women it, didn't do? No, it was illegal. illegal you know. And so those things are really easier for women to break down than some of the covert issues of, of discrimination today. Um, but all the, all the legal things have fallen away. Mm. We even have women bishops. That was one of the last things to go. I like this little anecdote in the book where you talk about the fact that you employed women, but not just women, but also mothers. And when somebody called, you'd play some audio of someone typing furiously just to kind of disguise the sound of a baby crying. Um, That, you know, it it seems crazy to me, but do you feel like we've moved on at all? Do you feel that the, the troubles that women have as mothers and trying to work, do you feel like it's changed? Or do you feel like women are still struggling to have it all? In some ways it's changed out of all recognition. But in others, I still hear women talking about um, the discrimination that they feel, whether it's real real or imagined, um, that uh, they feel that um, they're, they're, their sights are sort of not... It's not appropriate for them to... But the important thing is that women, we now have a choice. Um, very few women choose to work as I do. Um, 
many employers now allow people to work flexibly. And I'm conscious that I opened those doors for, for women and, and, and others um, because we were so flexible about what we did. You know, part-time, full-time, flexi-time we started, uh, homeworking, uh, office working, hot desking. Um, we even had a sort of cafeteria of benefits so that people could choose how they wanted to get paid by salary or possibly more holiday, less salary, this sort of thing. So we were really breaking new ground all the time. And it, when you look at the analysis of what women today want, two things come out very clearly. Um, it's always meant emphasis on flexibility. And secondly, work-life balance. And those things are available to women, but you have to sort of manoeuvre your way around mm. to get them. Talking about work-life balance, how, how do you think, how do you rate your work-life balance when you were at the height of your... My work-life balance was zilch, zero. I just didn't have any. Um, the only time I forgot my uh, learning disabled son, Giles, was when I was working. Basically, I work. Um, I didn't have holidays. I mean, you know, it sounds quite ridiculous. But when you're building up a company, you've got to give it your all. And I hadn't quite got my all because I did have family. Mm. And uh, they were difficult years, which um, honed me into the tough cookie that you see today. Software was traditionally given away free. Mm. What made you think, oh, let's start charging. Let's try and do something different. Well, I was very naive, really, because I hadn't learnt anything about how to run a business. And so my first um, work came from my ex-employer and a, a colleague's ex-employer and so on. Um, so how did I really go about it? I would look in the newspaper for advertisements for programmers and then would write in and sort of say, I'm not actually applying to do a for a programming job. I'm offering to do programming for you. <laughs> it wasn't quite the done thing. But every now and again, somebody would bite and sort of say, well, yes, I suppose as long as you could get it done mm. for us. And that's how it started. Mm. Very simple. Most of business is very simple. Mm. And with women at the time, was, it was more traditional, I think, for women to be programmers back then, potentially, than it is now. Can you tell me more about the kind of how it was back then and, and what you feel is when it tapered off slightly, when women stopped, they sort of t took time out or stepped out of the whole software pool? Well, programming actually started as a female job. It was mm. part of the clerical industry. Um, we had the coders at Bletchley Park who were in mm. the sort of background of some of the early, early work that was going on. Um, so it started off very feminine, and then what I think happened is that the men realised how important this was and how well paid it was. I could not believe mm. that I should be paid so well for doing something that was such fun. But um, so the men started to come in and basically sort of elbowed us out yeah. and so on. Um, in the early days, one did need mathematics to work on computing, so that took some people away. Um, now it's... I cannot understand why. Nothing could be more flexible, more fun, more international, more... You know, it doesn't matter how strong you are or the timbre of your voice. You can write software if you want to. And it is still very stimulating and fun. But uh, women in Britain are, are now starting to be taught coding again, mm. which is uh, an improvement. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, we know sexism exists. It exists in every single industry. Can you talk us through some of the sexism that you experienced and how you dealt with it? Partly certain courses of action were actually closed to us. The others were made just very difficult. And whatever you were doing, you seemed to be a sort of second-class citizen and be viewed very much as a sex object in, 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 the, in the workplace. Um, if you travelled on the underground tube system uh, in, in the rush hour when it was busy, um, you would often find a pair of hands come round your body and then hold you. I mean, it, it was impossible. The only way you could deal with it is, take your hands off mm. me. Which is what you said, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, one of the jobs that I applied for, um, I was told that 
many people believed that we could not possibly have a woman in that job. And they stood down from the appointments board, as they were called. Mm. Um, so a lot of things were very different. I mean, you'd be trying to, to sell um, some significant piece of software to a government department, for example, and, and the senior guy there would be sort of pinching your bottom and so on. You, you, you had to learn to deal with this. Um, I think my company learnt really um, to um, dress in a very unprovocative way. Um, we didn't wear trousers for a long time because that was considered unfeminine and I was not a feminist. Um, but we really had to struggle to be accepted as whole human beings. In parts of the world, women are still like that. It's, mm. it's easy to think in the Western world that this doesn't happen. Mm. But I've worked in Saudi Arabia, for example, where women still are second-class citizens mm. and can't do this and can't do that. And um, I disliked it less than I thought I would. Um, I was very respectful of their culture. I wore a buyer that covered me from top to toe. Even at my age, I kept my hair covered. So I was saying loud and clear, I do respect where mm. you are. Mm. Um, but when I spoke in public, um, the male and female would be segregated. And when I was talking about some of the issues of, um, uh, that were in any way feminine, we had an all-woman's group. And then the women would come in and take off their black abayas and underneath would be their designer finery and mm -hmm. so on. It was quite, and they, they were asking exactly the same sort of questions mm -hmm. as a group in Northampton or mm -hmm. New Jersey. Um, can you tell me through some of the projects that you did as part of your business? Like, what are the kind of projects that inspired you or you're most proud of or the ones that you think back of really fondly? We used to actually measure scale in terms of the number of women employed because it was a social business, that's mm. how I saw it. And we got up to teams of hundreds of women on one project. Um, the largest project that I was ever associated with was costed at half a billion pounds. So that was over many years. Mm -hmm. So it really became very professional. When it was less, um, you know, a project would be in and out in six months or something, uh, they were much more exciting because we did things like um, um, underwater weapons research mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, the black box flight recorder for I was going to ask you about that. Was, was that for Concorde? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that was, you know, quite a sophisticated software because we were taking readings from about 40 analog um, instruments, you know, the height you were and the acceleration that was going on and whatever, and the cockpit noises, um, and um, putting them into a, a really very safe, uh, best protected, they were called black box, which I assure you are not mm. black, they're bright yellow. <laughs> um, but um, some of them were quite um, small but interesting. I can remember one where, um, it was when I was with the post office, um, something had been stolen, a parcel in, in the mail. And uh, my job was to show that the piece of string that was round the parcel had been part of the roll of string that was in the accused person's shed. So it was a statistical problem. Mm. And it was such fun to think, oh, can I really do this? And yes, statistically you can show that it... I and what, was, he, was he the culprit? He was indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you proved it. Um, so we've talked about your business and it was very much a mission from the start, wasn't it? It wasn't really, it wasn't about money. And I, and I know that you felt it was a crusade. Can you tell me more about that? What it meant to you, what, what your reason behind employing so many women were? Well, it started off very selfishly. I wanted to be employed myself in, in a way that, in a, in a job that, that uh, appealed to me. And then I realized that there were so many other women with, with similar requirements. Um, so social changes happen by example, as soon as somebody saw me working on a freelance basis, they realized, oh, perhaps I could. And I never had to advertise for staff in the early days 
because the tiniest little mention in the press, mm -hmm. and I'd get a flood of applicants. Well, you know, I've got a PhD in computer science, though they didn't call it that in those days. I've worked for five years with General Electric Corporation. Um, can I come and do some coding for you? And so it was a very enthusiastic workforce that especially when later on that they were given shares in the company were highly motivated um, and they chose to work. It wasn't that they were money motivated. Mm. Can you tell me about the shares? Because I know that you are obviously pioneering in, in many different areas with the business. And one of them was being giving so much back to your staff. And I, and I know that you've talked about it before, but what was your reason behind doing that? And what was the result? Co-ownership with the staff is part of my giving back. Uh, I was given so much as a child refugee um, that what else can I do but give back? And in the company, it started off in something like year three uh, as we had a bonus system. So every six months, we would do all the, the sums and uh, say, well, this amount could be given back to the staff. And it was given out pro rata to, to their earnings. Um, and that was fine. There was sharing the profits. There were gross profits because we weren't really, really very professional in those days. Um, and then um, we had several years where there were no profits to share out at all. So twice a year, I'd be writing letters to all the staff so saying, well, this wonderful bonus system, but unfortunately, your bonus this time is nil. Mm. Um, and then we got through that 70s recession and somebody, it, it, the suggestion came from outside um, that we move it to a co-ownership, not just bonuses. And, and so we did that and it took years to make that happen because we were share, sharing shares, sharing the equity with not only the employees where there is legislation to, to help make that easy, but also with all the consultants and associates. Mm -hmm. And that was very much breaking new ground. Um, I do believe in um, sharing the profits. I believe it's a big incentive to entrepreneurs to realize that they can have less percentage of a larger cake mm -hmm. if they share in, in the early days. Mm -hmm. And when you start, you. I mean, I, I wasn't wise enough to do this, but when you start, you, you're desperately needing specialist skills for this, that, and the other, and you can't afford to buy them. Mm. But of course, if you offer, you know, we well, have 2% of the shares, if you can put me, provide this level of consultancy. Mm. Um, it's, uh, I, I think, a very positive thing. And certainly the company, I mean, to begin with, it didn't make any difference. So, you know, I, I gave 4% and, and then 6% and then 7% and then 17%. And it was really only when I gave, at our 25th anniversary, I gave a whole chunk that took it up to 25%. And the staff suddenly realised a quarter mm. of this company belongs to us. Mm. And then they began to take some real interest. And we put a lot of effort into the communication with the staff, started going around to all the regions. Uh, it wasn't just cold annual general reports, it was really talking about and talking in confidence with the staff about, well, we have the chance to do this or that. Can't do both, can't afford it, which do you want to do? Mm. So you'd get your staff involved in decision making? Yes. Is that right? yeah. And at one stage, we always said no, no board decision um, would. Uh, take place without, without the staff approval. Mm. Um, was that quite uh, difficult with so many uh, staff? Growing? I need to correct that, actually. Um, no board decision would take without consulting the staff. Mm. We didn't say we'd always follow what mm. they wanted to do in mm. a sort of referendum way. Mm. Um, what was your question? Well, I mean, did you find that, because obviously as you grow, it becomes more and more but difficult to But that's what information technology is for, to mm. be able to troll and get, get all those figures mm. in in a realistic way. We mm. didn't do it in real time. Mm. But, you know, a week before what that would be. So, it's extremely I mean, pioneering. I mean, <laughs> well, and even, I like even to now, new, looking yeah, back, it's I like to do pioneering. new things. Yeah. I don't yeah. like to be bored. No. I have a low threshold. No, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to talk about the highs and lows of entrepreneurial life, because... I was reading, I think it's quite common for when you start a business, you put so much trust in the people that you hire, senior management partners. And I, I noticed that there was a story about one of the women that you had, I think as managing director. Um, what, how 
difficult is it to not take these things personally when someone betrays you, someone you've employed? I don't think I'm the right person to talk about this because I was desperately hurt, I mean really seriously hurt, um, by a breakaway group um, who also went in for industrial espionage and stuff like that, um, of somebody that uh, I'd worked side by side with, where my husband was the godfather of her son and extraordinary things like that. Um, so I had no idea that I was vulnerable in that way. I was just running what I thought of as a family business. I knew the children's names, I knew who'd got measles, I knew who was having marital problems with it. Um, and it was very personal and took quite a, a, a period of time to not only professionalise the business, but to separate myself from the business, to, uh, uh, to separate my finances from the business, um, because you know, I'd take a personal mortgage for the company. And eventually, you know, the company has to take its own mortgage mm -hmm. and um, borrow for itself. So it was a long, painful process. Uh, I can't say uh, w women did. We didn't have any commercial experience, so the mistakes that we made were quite basic ones. And for example, our pricing started off wrong and stayed wrong. You know, year after year, decade after decade, pricing was wrong. So we In had what a sense too low. Too or? low. Yeah. So we had a sort of profitless prosperity mm -hmm. because we were getting revenue and we were growing. But when you look at the profit margin, mm -hmm. it was going down and down and down. Mm -hmm. And it needed professional managers to come in and really make it professional. Do you feel that your naivety? in the fact that you hadn't set up a business before. Do you think that served you well? Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, it did. I mean, I, 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 I was, had no financial knowledge at all, so I managed the business on a cash basis. Now, in the short term, that was very amateur. Um, but in the long term, um, it really allowed me to build market share and, and get a position in, a, in an industry. In talking about some of the low points also at running your own business, I know that you went through difficult times in terms of recession. Now, but you know, you didn't stop, you didn't give up because of this crusade. Can you tell me some of the ways that you kind of pulled yourself out of it? I think that crusade was what kept me going. I mean, I can remember sitting at home actually rocking. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What, what can I do? It was sick making, you know, this, this, your stomach was actually churning. And why? Because I thought this woman's company would go down and be remembered only as a so-called fair weather company that was fine when the market was growing but couldn't manage the recession. So we cut out basically pretty well everything except the essentials. Um, a lot of staff went and of course since many of them were freelancers mm -hmm. Um, I, I just had to still say, look, don't expect much work from us for the next 18 months because mm. we haven't got any. Um, and bless their cotton socks, um, they would attend conferences and things like that, nicely dressed, unpaid, but saying that they came from F International. Um, so they, they helped me through that recession. I learnt then, I think, the, the art of the liquidator, this business of getting rid of all the bits and pieces that you can manage and just focus. And that, because previously I was rushing around after anything that moved, mm. but focus is very important. And when the professional managers came in, they, they underlined that. They focused in a different way. But I learned, if you don't focus, you're probably not going to make it. What is a highlight for you when you look back? I'm not money-oriented, and, and all my highlights were really to do with staff. When a consultant suggested, much to my um, initial antipathy, um, that we should only pay staff when the client paid us. You can't do that. Mm. But we were consultants, and by gearing the payments in that way, 80% of our cash flow problems disappeared. And people did get used to it. If they didn't like it, they didn't need to work for us, but there was nobody else employing them anyway. Uh, we used um, zero-hour contracts, which are now considered very antisocial. Um, they worked very well for us because that's what people want if they want to be um, have flexible opportunities. I saw um, growth in terms always of number of people employed. 
And uh, the first time I sold a major project, and it was for a city um, company, it was about a quarter of a million pounds, a long time ago, so it would be a lot more than that now. And I was so excited, and you know, this was work for 20 people for two years or whatever it was, um, and I was thrilled. I, 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 I didn't know what to do. And so I phoned an ex-lover, actually, um, and, and really, really sort of said, I must tell somebody about this. Um, so the excitement of sales is, is, mm. kept me going. Mm. Do you think out of all the skills that you had, was sales the thing that kind of got you through? As in, obviously, you had tenacity and you were persistent, but what was this kind of skill that you honed so well that helped the business the most, do you think? What were you best at? I think because I like people, and once people... They may not respect me or like me particularly, but they know that I'm honest and mm. we can work together and that it's fine for you to help me this morning and I'll help Jane this afternoon. What do you think makes a great entrepreneur? Well, I don't think it's the money motivation, um, which is what's always quoted in what one reads. But the motivation seems, it, it seems to work best for an entrepreneur when we find something that we really care about, uh, we focus on it um, and let the money follow the pleasure that we get from doing that. So, you know, I went into software because that's what I love. Um, unfortunately, in entre entrepreneurs, it's the first thing also I stopped doing because after very short period of time I was dealing with the cash flow and the HR problems and, and all the hassle of running a business and I was paying other people to write the software. But that is what happens for most entrepreneurs. You've mentioned in the book about this depression that you felt. Can you tell me what kind of hold it had over you? What kind of helped you on the path to recovery? Well my depression came very much from survivor um, guilt which leads to depression. And it was quite serious. I had um, six years of analysis to get myself out of that. Um, I did later on have a breakdown, but that was probably not um, depression. What seems, well, I, I do believe in analysis to help people out, so really the talking therapies. Don't terribly believe in pills, but if, if you really are depressed, it's much better to take them and get yourself to a good place again and then uh, wean yourself off. But the thing that I really have found helps with depression is compassion. And that's why I find that my f philanthropic work, I get just as much as I give. Mm. And I, I would recommend that sort of activity. Helping others is a good antidote to depression. Can you tell me about your philanthropy work? Well, my philanthropy has gone to the two things that I know and care about, and that's information technology and um, autism, which is my late son's disorder. And the majority of it has gone to autism. Now, your um, listeners, readers, audience, will probably be more interested in the IT side. So I set up um, a livery company in the City of London. That was a sort of £5 million project in about, about 25 years ago now. Um, I set up the Oxford Internet Institute. And then I did a series of projects which included both computing and autism. Um, for example, some virtual reality projects uh, up in Nottingham University, which were there to teach people with autism um, how to find their ways around. It was a virtual city, how to find things like how to find a seat on a bus, things that most people just take for granted. Sure. But children with autism have to be taught how to do that, mm -hmm. otherwise they'll sit on the first available seat, which is not, not a good thing to do. Um, I mean, currently, I'm just starting to use robots for teaching pupils with autism. And it's a sort of charming little robot, um, able to sort of teach life skills to pupils who are without speech, mm. uh, are very, very vulnerable, but actually focus very well to a robotic teacher. Mm. Maybe they're not as threatened. Yeah. So there's all sorts of things going on. And another charity of mine, which is looks after 127 people with autism, 
um, is now using fingerprint technology instead of keys so that each uh, resident um, can get into their own room with their own fingerprint and they can't get into somebody else's and they can't lose the key and mm. all that. What do you wish your legacy to be? Well, part of my legacy, I'm, I'm so proud of the, my memoir, and it is a memoir rather than an autobiography. Um, and I'm so thrilled that it's being made into a film. And that might be my legacy that would actually inspire over the years. And I hope it will become a classic. Mm. Um, so I have great hopes for that. And I have two or three years of exciting things to do because I've never made a film before. Mm. And, uh, mm. Are you able to be t taking part in the process? Or? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I read in your book this phrase that really s struck me, and that is, I need to justify the fact that my life was saved. Do you still feel like that? And, and do you ever consider that actually you ultimately saved yourself? I think that feeling that I need to justify my own existence is as strong today as it was 75 years ago. Um, I mean, I was five when that happened. I was six, seven, eight by the time I really began to realise what had happened and my part in a little bit of history. Um, but um, no, I still need to make sure that each day is worth living. And um, I don't think that's something that I have achieved. I think I was, many, many people helped me, and strangers helped me. Um, Jewish and Christian activists who set up the Kinder Transport, the Quaker Society of Friends who funded it when it went, ran out of money, uh, Catholic nuns who helped to educate me. Um, once you've been given so much, you realise that I've been helped, but it's now up to me to help other people. Like to be like Daniela or Dan Dan Danielle. Danielle. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your life very early on and about your journey over here. Can you tell me about that? The things I can remember, Daniela. I'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> right. The thing that I can really remember, Danielle. How do I say it? Danielle. Danielle. I better avoid it. Yeah. avoid it. Avoid it. Avoid <laughs> it. It's going to hiccup over.